As the war between Israel and Hamas continues in Gaza, comes word that the Yemen-based Houthis are also launching attacks against the Jewish state. Now, to talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, some are quite concerned that the Biden administration is emboldening Iran and their proxies, including the Houthis. Yeah, and the Houthis are not just targeting Israel, but they're also targeting the United States. Um, this are... It, the United States and the Biden administration wants us to believe these are two separate narratives. So since October 7th, of course, we've been watching the war unfold as Hamas attacked Israel brutally. The hostages are still there in Hamas, in Gaza, etc. Uh, since that day, there have been over 100 attacks by Iran's proxies against U.S. assets in the region. We're talking about Iraq, Syria, and of course, the Houthis in Yemen, which you mentioned. We're talking about deterrence, not something that we can do today, but something that should have been done from the beginning of the Biden administration to give the message to Iran's regime that this is not something that the United States will, in fact, accept. Now, it's very difficult to tell the same Iran regime that has been begged for a nuclear deal, that has been given concessions, that has been given billions of dollars. Sanctions have been removed from the re regime. Uh, and now, you know, it's very difficult for the United States to rein that all in and say, you know what, enough is enough. You have to stop these. So, um, you know, of course, the Biden administration not wanting this to escalate, and I don't blame them. They don't want the United States to get involved in another war. But at the same time, it seems like these one-off responses to these provocations are not sending a clear message to Tehran that the United States uh, means business. And of course, um, you know, micromanaging Israel's war from the White House is not something that has gone well in, in, in certain ways. Let Israel finish the job, uh, Hamas, or back down. Or, you know, you watch John Kirby at the podium with these reporters uh, in his press briefings, and it's a difficult job because you have reporters who do not understand, have not been the, the the situation has not properly been explained to them, and all they look at is is the death toll not being proportional, um, and so here we are. But the, uh, the the proxies continue to to fire down on uh, U.S. assets, and of course, as we know, the war between Hamas and Israel continues. Several several uh, ceasefire deals have been presented uh, by the mediators, and uh, Hamas continues to say no. So here we are. You know, Lisa the. The Palestinian Health Authority, which is run by Hamas, says that more than 20,000 Palestinians have died so far in Gaza. Now, we see a lot of the death and destruction there, but how can we really believe the Health Authority, since it's run by Hamas, when they talk about 20,000? They say mostly women and children. Right. And there's different numbers floating around 20,000. I saw somewhere 30,000. I mean, the, the number keeps going up. And then they, you know, of course, there has been death and destruction. Of course, there have been young children who have, have died. And I know that, that that's not something that anyone wants to deny. It's not something anyone wants to see. Everyone wants to see an end to this war. But when you see, for example, um, people ask me about the Al Jazeera reporters that have been killed in, in, in the midst of this war and said, how, how is Israel targeting reporters? Well, Sure enough, this morning, um, the Times of Israel had the story about how these these journalists, the specific ones that we're talking about, were embedded with terrorists, and that's how they they were killed because they were right there. Um, you know, it, it it just there's there's an answer for for everything. The the, the reason why the death toll is so high is because Hamas, who again is the leadership for the Palestinian people, we look at them as as ISIS. We look at them like you know any other terror organization, but they are the leaders. They're the ones, as you said, that run the health ministry. They're the ones who are reporting and giving facts out to the New York Times and CNN and everyone else who's believing them. Um, that That's the issue that we have here. And again, this is a war. There is death, there's destruction, there's a death toll. But how can we actually vet? How can we confirm these numbers? How can we verify anything? We can't. The only thing that we can reiterate and hope for, and, and I know that President Biden and has, has tried to do this, is to press Hamas to get the civilians out of harm's way. Israel has given them an opportunity, even though it upsets their strategy, right? What 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 group or what sovereign nation wants to go to their enemy and say, hello, we're coming, get out of the way. Um, but they feel that they have to because there's so many Palestinians being used as human shields. They're hiding in hospitals and schools and mosques and places that are off limits in any other given situation, but for Hamas, it's again, it's collateral, and it's um, it's it, they they put them in the way, and this is what we're dealing with. So, 
Nobody wants to see that number go up. Nobody wants to see Palestinian children or Israeli children die. Uh, these are senseless deaths, and we hope that it stops very soon, and we hope those hostages come home, and we hope for a ceasefire. We hope for all of that. But um, really, the, the terrorists are calling the shots here, and that's very unfortunate. Israel Defense Forces recently discovered that Hamas was creating precision-guided missiles and other strategic weapons with the assistance of Iran. Right. So, you know, this is crazy how I get asked these questions on a daily basis, whether it's in formal interviews like this one or even on Twitter, where people are like, how can you really be sure that Iran is involved? Well, here you go. We know we have evidence. There has been uh, reporting extensive with detail reporting about how Iran has been involved in the planning, in the, the actual choosing the date of the October 7th attack, in funding uh, along with Qatar and, and, and uh other terror uh, helpers, uh, and also uh, in, in now in, in, in getting uh, weaponry and, and building weaponry. We know for a fact that Iran's regime is pulling the puppet strings behind this attack. We also know that they're providing weapons and very um, advanced weapons to both Hamas and Hezbollah, by the way. And that is the fear that has, if Hezbollah gets involved, they're going to be using weapons that the Iron Dome perhaps cannot handle or, or Israel cannot um, as easily handle two fronts that have become much more sophisticated than Israel anticipated or perhaps the global community had calculated in the sense that Iran's regime has really upped the game for these terror organizations. They're not just, you know, these terror rats in a hole. They have now built sophisticated tunnel systems. They have sophisticated weaponry. And of course, with Iran's regime helping them with the billions of dollars that they have pouring into uh, terror, this is this is this is not a you know a child's game in terms of of the sophistication of the strategy um, of all of it. There are also reports right now, Lisa, that Lebanon based Hezbollah is threatening Israel with fighting without limits. And those words were documented by the Middle East Media Research Institute. Right. And um, and we've heard this many times from from uh, Hezbollah and from Iran's regime warning Israel to back down, to scale down their war against Hamas in Gaza um, with threats that uh, if if Hezbollah in southern Lebanon gets involved, then, as you said, no limits, meaning anything goes, they will destroy and take Israel off the map, which is has always been um, their threat. I want to remind people when this regime, Iran's regime, came into power, toppling the Shah 44, now almost 45 years ago, their main focus was on two enemies, the big Satan, which was the United States, and the small Satan, which was uh, Israel, right there in the region within arm's reach. And they have done everything to rally people around the flag, which really has not worked because after 45 years, we saw all those protesters on the streets really calling out Iran's regime, knowing that they have put all their money and the people's money into terrorism. Uh, and, and that hasn't stopped. The only people we really have to convince is the mainstream media, the people in the West, leaders in the West, in Europe, the United States and Canada, that these are the bad guys uh, and they do not do good, not for their people, not for the people of the world, not for national security, not for global security. And that's where we are. Um, you know, Iran's regime is the head of the dragon. They are the ones who are funding Hezbollah, funding Hamas, funding suicide bombers, supporting the Houthis in Yemen, supporting insurgencies in Syria and Iraq. And, you know, enough is enough. I mean, people are, are dying, losing their lives senselessly for, for, for what? Now, Iran has arrested 11 people as the death toll has risen to 91 in connection with twin suicide bombings in the southeastern city of Kerman last week, Lisa. Yeah, this is an interesting story, Helen. I think um, a lot of people are getting it wrong, so I, I thank you for bringing it up. This was a memorial service at the grave site of Qasem Soleimani. If you remember, Qasem Soleimani was a Quds uh, leader for the Revolutionary Guard. He was one of the masterminds of pulling all the different strings in the Middle East in, for, for, for Iran's proxies. He was taken out by the Trump administration in a drone strike January of 2020. Uh, so this was was at his memorial in Kerman. Um, it was very, very mysterious because no one from the government was there and they call him a hero. They call him a martyr. They call him all sorts of things. So if he was so iconic, why wasn't anyone from the government there? No one was there from his immediate family. These were all supporters that gathered there. After the bombing, many in the in the government were quick to blame Israel. Many pundits here in the West, very quick to blame Israel. 
Very shortly thereafter, ISIS quickly takes credit. Now, the two things I want to bring people's attention to is, A, ISIS is very quick to take credit for terror plots that they did not participate in, merely because they think it's up for grabs and they can get some street credit. Secondly, Iran's regime is very quick to throw down false flags for many reasons, to distract the world from, from other uh, stories that are going on, to rally these lower religious socioeconomic brackets around the flag, which they did in the Iran-Iraq war. They would do it again here to say, oh, we need our constituencies back. Because if you remember how, when we had those freedom protests in Iran, there have been protests in clerical cities as well. So they're losing that constituency. Maybe they want to bring them back. But this all goes to say, we're still not sure who committed these bombs. That death toll continues to rise. These people went to the memorial and, of course, lost their lives in the suicide bombing. Um, ISIS taking credit, Iran's regime, we're not sure who, who was involved. We're not sure why would they want to distract, but we know that there's much more to the story. A ramming attack at an East Jerusalem checkpoint killed a four-year-old Palestinian girl, Lisa, and wounded a woman on Sunday. Also over the weekend, an East Jerusalem driver was shot and killed hours after a roadside bomb killed a border police officer, a female police officer, and injured three others. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, the growing front of this war. It's going beyond, obviously, Gaza. We're talking about West Bank now. Um, you know, it, it, it's just rogue, right? These are car rammings. These are do-it-yourself. These are one-offs. Um, these aren't necessarily Hamas fighters. Maybe they are. They could be just, you know, radicalized Palestinians who are taking matters into their own hands. And as you said, a child was killed. A Palestinian child was killed. Collateral damage. Um, you know, why are children in these places? Why are they growing up with all of this? I don't know if you saw how the this went viral. It was a puzzle that was found in one of the homes in Gaza, and it was a child, a children's puzzle, and it was all about you know, with guns and bombs and killing Israelis and bloodied flags. I mean, why are children growing up with this? Why are, do they have to witness this? Why do they have to really have this experience growing up rather than just having a, a normal childhood? Um, and that's really the question. I mean, we've, we've always said the Palestinian people deserve more. We keep saying they deserve more. But when they're growing up with terrorism from a young age, they're growing up as, as uh, you know, it, radicalized. They're growing up to hate. And then th there's nothing you can do after a certain point. So um, this is something that really the UN has to address, the West has to address, and really get to the root of it. We have to send the kids more Barbies and little Hot Wheels, you know, stuff that we grew up with playing. Now, Lisa, there are reports from Reuters that Iraq's prime minister has threatened to oust all forces assigned to a U.S.-led coalition to defeat the Islamic State in the country. This follows a U.S. airstrike on a terrorist militia leader in Baghdad. Yeah, you know, this has probably more to do with the U.S. strike on the militia leader in, in Iraq. And the reason for that is Iran's proxies are operating in Iraq. Now, the unfortunate thing is when the U.S. withdrew most of their, their presence from Iraq, uh, we handed Iraq over on a silver platter to Iran's regime and their proxies. They then had to get along with the local uh, government there. And they did. And now you have insurgencies that are not just insurgencies there, but they are very well in bed with Iraq's government. And that is why they were very upset about the U.S. strike um, in Iraq and now are threatening to remove the presence that we have over there. Um, you know, it, it's 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 a small presence, but it, it's important to keep some sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, representation uh, in Iraq, in Syria, um, and, and not have what, what we're having right now. But anyway, the, the, Iran's proxies, you know, have obviously this monopoly over all these countries. They have, they have worked on having a presence there. They have worked on these relationships, and, and this is very much indicative of that growing relationship. Here's a scary story. The Taliban in Afghanistan, Lisa, who took over control of the country when the U.S. withdrew its military personnel, are now reportedly seeking access to nuclear weapons. And there are talks with North Korea to do so? Absolutely. This is a scary story. Not only um, the fact that the Taliban want nuclear weapons, the, the fact that the Taliban's, in, in, you know, it's almost like when we talk about Hamas ruling Gaza, another terror organization, the Taliban ru ruling Afghanistan, another country we served up on a silver platter to the terrorists. Um, now they are after nuclear weapons. But not just that, the fact that these rogue nations they're finding these strange bedfellows and 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 really collaborating and helping each other out. Talk about Iran selling weapons to Russia. Talk about the Taliban going over to North Korea. Talk about China and Iran, um, you know, selling oil to to China and making trade deals. 
Talk about China brokering a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I mean, the list goes on and on. And this happened only within the last three years of the Biden administration. But I know that our enemies are watching. They know that they can play out the clock and they have another year to do whatever they need to do before we have our elections here. And we get a new uh, president here in the United States, hopefully a new one. Um, but what we shall see. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it really speaks to a weak foreign policy where these rogue nations can just go marching, uh, you know, in and helping each other out and, and um, really teaching each other the tricks of the trade to outmaneuver the West. And um, it, it's not it's not too difficult to outmaneuver a very weak Washington, D.C., and that's what we're watching. She's a foreign affairs expert and host of the Foreign Desk in Los Angeles. Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you.